Hello, and welcome to the sixth lecture for English 421Y. In this video, I will briefly describe the visual instructions or procedures assignment, discuss strategies for producing a visually dominant document, and provide a few examples. For the second part of Unit 2, you will create a separate document that presents similar information as your textual instructions, but for a different audience and situation, and using primarily visual information. The setting can be the same as Unit 1, for example, a current internship or job, but I want you to imagine a scenario, audience, and purpose that are better suited to visual instructions. It's okay if they are pretty similar, but you will need to strategically match your genre and rhetorical situation in a way that makes sense. You will also need to select a predominantly visual genre, whether print or digital, and then determine the tools and media that will work best for your needs. While the information on the textual and visual documents can be similar, you are allowed to change your angle to take into account the different possibilities of textual and visual media. For example, last semester I had a student who was in uh, astronautical engineering who was very interested in low Earth orbit. He did a PDF as his textual instructions, and it had a very sort of detailed uh, description of how, a, how to produce a model of low Earth orbit. In a video, he then used the game Kerbal Space Program, and he recorded himself playing the game, to demonstrate how to achieve low Earth orbit with a model. In both cases, he was presenting the same or similar information, but he was doing so in a different way for a slightly different audience. He saw his first audience as being somebody who was not familiar at all with uh, low Earth orbit, and the second as being somebody who was already familiar with it but wanted to see a detailed description. Um, He did, in, in his two instructions, showed the same information, slightly different ways. Uh, you might decide to have uh, your visual instructions and your textual instructions be different parts of a larger process. Um, or to show different aspects. One might show a general view and one might show a specific view. One might show an expert view and the other might show a novice view. There's different ways of doing it. In your proposal memo, uh, you, I will be looking for you to kind of outline your different approach. Uh, whenever I teach this project, someone always points out that an, an effective document should have a balance between visuals and text. I completely agree, but this assignment is meant to challenge your critical thinking and problem solving by forcing you to use the two extremes rather than the more logical middle ground. Ideally, you should see that there are negatives to both all visual and all textual instructions that can be mitigated with a more balanced approach that combines the relative strengths of both. But for this project, I want you to see how difficult it is to do textual instructions with only a little bit of images and visual instructions with only a little bit of text. A key thing to remember is that you can include text in your visual instructions, just as you can include images in your textual instructions. But the meaning should be communicated primarily by the visuals rather than by the text. Let me explain what I mean by returning to Graves and Graves chapter 8, where they describe how visuals can be used to create meaning within instructions and procedures. Depending on the purpose, they argue, visuals can be used to clarify the text, support it, or supplement it. They then, if you recall, identify four methods for relating text and visuals in order to create meaning within a document. The first is on page 237. So they outline it here. The four are stage setting visuals, redundant visuals, complementary visuals, and supplementary visuals. So the first is stage setting, which is using visuals to communicate information that is different than the text on the same page, but is used to forecast the content of the text ahead. So that's presenting a, uh, a, a visual, uh, in this case, I believe it is a diagram 
of content that is coming up later in the presentation. Presenting it early allows the user to understand the image and how the different pieces relate, and then it gets explained. Redundant visuals are when visuals and text convey exactly the same information in order to repeat the key ideas, especially for processes or concepts that are complex and challenging. So redundant visuals, we see this all the time in textbooks, when you have a description of a chemical reaction, and then you have a uh, detailed description of visual description of what is actually happening on sort of a, a nuclear level or, or whatever. Um, complementary visuals are when text and visuals each provide slightly different information, and both are required to ensure full understanding. The two modes together communicate the complete idea better than either one would alone. So Graves and Graves give the example of a technical description of how to use a particular piece of software. You have this textual instructions step by step on the left, and then you have a visualization, different screenshots of different pieces of the software, selective, not the whole screen, but they're using just pieces of a screenshot and then description in captions. Together, this is more clear than either is on their own. And then finally, supplementary. Supplementary visuals, one of the models is dominant, conveying the main information, while the other mode mostly confirms or elaborates the point. This method is the most common way to integrate text and graphics, often with the text being the dominant message and the visuals serving as an example. You can see this here, where the meaning communicated by the text is supplemented by the visuals. If the visuals were on their own, it would mean nothing. You wouldn't understand what the purpose of the instructions were. In an ideal world, all text would have complementary text and visuals, while redundant and stage setting visuals would be used strategically and with deliberate purpose. Because we don't live in an ideal world, most documents instead have a supplementary use of visuals. That is, the text is communicating the primary meaning, the visuals are only there to supplement the text. For the visual instructions assignment, I am deliberately asking you to make visuals the dominant mode of conveying meaning, a role that, as Graves and Graves note, usually goes to text. We will return to the complementary redundant and stage setting methods when we work on page design during unit four. Now I wanna show the first of two examples. This is perhaps one of the most famous examples of predominantly visual instructions, the Lego manual. Why are Lego manuals so effective? This is the, the question that I'm asking you to explore in detail in our sixth activity. I won't give all the information away, but in this lecture, I wanna briefly describe some aspects of Lego instructions that make them so effective. This is a 228 page manual, and yet it's extremely easy to use. There is zero words in the entire document. There are no textual instructions or textual descriptions. Everything is done visually. How do they do it? You will be considering this question in more detail in activity six, but I wanna give a few hints here because I think they illustrate some important information about visual instructions. First, goals are clearly identified. What you are building is clearly identified in each section. So here you give, in this orange box, you see what the whole Star Destroyer, I'm a Star Wars nerd, uh, looks like. And then you see beneath here, this is what you're actually building, the internal structure of the larger piece. So the current objective is communicated through these orange boxes that show the final product next to the section the user is currently working on. This juxtaposition instantly identifies the current goal in relation to the larger goal. You are always able to flip back and say, okay, here's what I'm working on, and here's how it relates to the larger whole. 
You'll also see that steps are numbered. Each step in the process is carefully identified with large white numbers. While substeps within a larger step are identified with yellow boxes or smaller numbers. Here we have the larger numbers, we have the smaller substeps, and then we have the yellow boxes that show an even smaller sub substep. Change indicates progress. Progress is shown through the accumulation of each step, which is done by contrasting one step or substep with the next so you know to compare what you have to what the instructions show before moving on. So for instance, this step shows you what you should have up to this point. You can then see they're adding to that. Every single time you see the juxtaposition of what you, are, what you, are, what you should have and what you are working towards. So that you can compare, okay, this is what I have up to this point, and then this is what they are telling me to add from this yellow box to what I previously had. This is a key grammar of Lego instructions that at first is kind of odd, but quickly becomes natural. You are used to seeing the accumulation of these pieces rather than each piece separately. Lego instructions also have consistently repeated elements. Even though what the user is building changes every page, the design elements stay consistent throughout. Impressively, after only a few pages into a 228 page document, you have seen all the major design features and visual grammar necessary to read the entire 200 plus made page manual without any explanatory text. It teaches you how to use it as you go. For example, here, We've already seen the yellow box indicating substeps. Now we get a green box. Well, we know that previously the yellow little box was indicated to show a substep. So now we can assume that the green box is showing a substep within a substep. It teaches you to prepare for different variations on the grammatical language that it's using. There's a lot more that can be uh, said about Lego instructions. And again, I'm asking you to go into more detail on this for activity six. Together, the, the elements that I've talked about and some of the elements that I hope you talk about create a consistent, simple, and compact visual language. The trade-off is that because each step is broken down literally piece by piece, the manuals end up being very long and somewhat intimidating. 228 pages is a lot. If you've ever built a Lego set with a child, you know that this can sometimes create problems. I know as a kid, I often played with the minifigures while my dad finished building whatever we were supposed to be building. However, the benefits of this approach is that you can print the same manual anywhere in the world without worrying about translating the instructions. Yes, what it says on the front page or, or whatever is going to be different, but the same set of instructions, anyone who speaks any language can open them up and understand them because there is no text. You can also reuse the same design for almost every Lego set since the only thing that changes is what you are building. This is a pretty complex uh, set of Lego set that is probably meant for you know an older teen or an adult. Something that is meant for a much younger uh, user uses the same visual language and the same general structure. It's just a little bit simpler. Shifting gears slightly, uh, perhaps the most important thing to remember when creating visuals is that, like a resume, they must be user-centered documents. In the chapter that I have assigned from Edward Tufte's The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, it's called Graphical Excellence, uh, he argues that visuals must, must tell a rich, coherent story. Too often, we think of visuals as self-evidence, or worse, we only imagine them only from our perspective as the writer and what we hope to accomplish. Imagining instead that our visuals are telling a story or narrative rather than just communicating truth that we've already accepted but our audience has yet to accept, allows us to think about it, graphics in terms of not just the information that is communicated, but the reaction we hope to get from an audience. That reaction might simply be to accept the information provided, or it might be to prompt an action, to make an argument, to get attention, or even to entertain. 
As Tuft writes at the end of this chapter, graphical excellence is that which gives to the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space. Graphical excellence means not just efficiency, but communicating the information to the reader in a way that is easy for them to then use it for their purposes. It's not just efficiency for you as a writer, it's effectiveness for the reader. What is communicating complex information to them as quickly as possible in the most effective way? This means that the best visuals are not the most complicated or even the best designed, but rather those that work more effectively for the user. Tuft also identifies three general characteristics of, graphi of graphical excellence, clarity, precision, and efficiency. You'll notice clarity and precision are both also aspects of technical writing, of effective technical writing. Efficiency is something that we don't necessarily think about as being important in technical writing, but it is because every page that you have to print or every uh, part of a website that you have to design is not just more work for you as the technical writer, it's more content that the user has to go through in order to get your point. What I want you to take from Tuft isn't a specific set of how-to steps for creating visuals. You'll notice that this chapter doesn't really contain much content. It's a lot of description of different types of visuals, a lot of breakdown of categories, in this case data maps, and the next example is time series. He talks about different types of visuals, different types of data visualizations. The more important thing isn't that you go out and are able to create a data map, but rather general inspiration from the range of examples that he provides as well as an appreciation for how text and visuals work together. He gives so many examples. They're so different and so complex and so interesting. What I want you to do is just spend some time looking at these to get inspiration for the visuals that you'll be creating for your visual instructions. As you look through Tuff's examples, stop and really look at how these visuals work. What makes them interesting? What makes them clear, efficient, and precise. What style or techniques do you think are most effective in what he's presenting? Personally, I really, really like the life cycle of the Japanese beetle that's presented here on page 443. I think it gives an excellent example of how to describe a complex topic, in this case, how a beetle goes from a larva to a beetle, and then how it goes back to then uh, be prepared for its next phase of its life. You can see it's broken down with some text. You have the months split out. You have a combination of sketches with a more sort of uh, table-like view. It's just a really, really unique and interesting visual. Finally, I want to end this lecture with a brief word about genre. You have free reign to decide how best to communicate your instructions or procedures to your audience, but I strongly recommend selecting a genre that is current and relevant, familiar to the audience, easy to develop, and that plays to your strengths. The example that I gave previously of the student who did the video of the Kerbal Space Program, he knew how to use that game, he knew how to use iMovie, and he knew that it was a pretty cool way, doing a, a video game tutorial or a video game walkthrough uh, or a let's play is a pretty common YouTube genre, and he just took that and adapted it to technical instructions. To demonstrate the importance of these four best practices, I will use a recent genre that you've likely seen on Facebook, BuzzFeed's Tasty Videos. Tasty Videos, which I had one all set to go. Let me get back to it really quick. Tasty videos 
uh, are a relevant take on an established genre that uses the current trend of sharing short viral videos on social media to change how people get recipes. Since most of BuzzFeed's audience has a smartphone or tablet, these videos are designed specifically to be accessed by a phone or tablet via a range of different social media apps. You don't you aren't necessarily seeking out tasty videos. Rather, you encounter them when someone shares them on your Facebook feed. Second, now that audiences are familiar with this genre of minute-long, hypervisual POV perspective recipe videos, we're starting to see it replace more traditional recipe videos. The other day, I was on uh, Facebook and I saw a what I thought was a BuzzFeed tasty video, but it turned out to be a food network video that had been they took a you know traditional 30 minute long uh, food network cooking demonstration show and turned it into a video. Third, these videos are relatively easy to develop as they have little text, no dialogue or narration, and only show an actor's hands. You don't need to pay Emeril Lagasse or Ina Garten tons of money in order to be the the cook cooking personality. You just need someone to make it and then someone to, you know, use the spoon or whatever while they're doing it. That means they're, they definitely require a considerable amount of editing, but they're likely cheaper than a traditional cooking show. Fourth, BuzzFeed plays to their strengths by reconceiving a recipe as a short viral video almost exclusively communicated on social media. This kind of video is what BuzzFeed is known for, and they simply replicated for recipes what has worked for videos about cute kittens and puppies. You can choose a more conventional genre, like a poster or infographic, or you can select a more recent and popular trend. Whatever you choose, make sure it emerges from your scenario, it would be something that would be familiar to your audience, and it would be appropriate to your context. That's it for today. Good luck on developing your visual instructions.